When I think of nuclear reactor incidents during the Cold War, normally Russia, the US and the UK jump to mind. However, one of the first ever nuclear reactor incidents to happen in the world was in Canada. Luckily though, in this story, no one was killed in a horrific way by a rogue part of the reactor. The unlikely venue for a potential catastrophic incident might be surprising. However, the research reactor in Canada was for a time the world's most powerful research facility. Even more bizarrely, the aftermath of the partial meltdown will be cleaned up by a team of individuals, including a future president of the United States of America. Like most early nuclear endeavors of the Cold War, our story begins during the Second World War. Canada found itself the ideal place for atomic research, being mostly out of the reach of the Axis forces. A collaborative arrangement between Canada and the UK in 1942 arose under the Montreal Laboratory of Canada's National Research Council. The NRC used scientists from Canada, Britain and a number of European countries displaced from the Nazi occupation of mainland Europe. The main goal was to develop a heavy water reactor research facility. Later on into the project, the USA also got involved. A town called Chalk River, 110 miles northwest of Ottawa, was selected for the site for the nuclear research facility. The area was ideal for a nuclear reactor, being next to the Ottawa River, which would become a healthy source of cooling water. In 1945, the world's first non-USA-based nuclear reactor, known as the ZEEP, or Zero Energy Experimental Pile, went online, marking Chalk River as one of the world's centers for atomic development. The new reactor would be used as a leading experimental tool for developing heavy water based systems and would pave the way for the reactor that the title of this video is about, the NRX. The National Research Experimental Reactor, abbreviated to NRX, was the direct successor to the ZEEP and was heavy water moderated and light water cooled, capable of creating 10 megawatts of power when it first went operational in 1947. Firstly, the heavy water slows down the resulting neutrons from fission creating a greater likelihood of more fission reactions. The second form of governing the reactor came from the control rods, which are used to absorb neutrons without themselves fissioning. The removal of water or the inserting of the rods can stop fission reducing the power output or shutting down the reactor completely. The reactor consisted of an aluminium calandra, basically a big cylindrical tank of water, eight meters wide by three meters high. Inside the calandra housed the core consisting of 175 6 cm diameter vertical tubes arranged in a hexagonal lattice. Located inside most of the tubes were the fuel elements surrounded by air. Surrounding the tubes and inside the calandra was up to 14,000 litres of heavy water topped off with helium gas to prevent corrosion of the reactor core's components. The whole reactor was surrounded by thick concrete walls and topped off by a rotating deck, and below the calandra was a sump designed to catch any heavy water leak. Three heavy water storage tanks were located below the reactor and were 4.7 millimeters thick, made of stainless steel, and were mainly empty. Even though the NRX represented the apex of reactor design, a replacement was even in the works as early as 1947. The fuel inside the NRX was formed into 3.1 meter long, 31 millimeter diameter rods, consisting of an outer sheath, a cooling water annulus, and an inner sheath, weighing a hefty 55 kilograms per element. The outer sheath was surrounded by the air inside the tube, located at the reactor core, and had a flow of around 8 kilograms a second. The cooling water inside the annulus came from the Ottawa River at a flow rate of up to 250 litres of water per second. The fuel rods extended both above and below the calandra, as can be seen in this 1961 report into the design of the NRX. To control the reactor, 12 of the vertical tubes were employed as control rods, made of boron carbide powder inside steel container tubes. The rods were held in place by powerful electromagnets above the reactor. This design feature was ingenious as in the event of a power failure, and the de-energization of the magnets would cause the rods to fall with the help of gravity into the reactor core, shutting down any further chain reactions. To remove the control rods, a set schedule had to be used in order to maintain control of the reactor, and to reduce the risk of any unforeseen flux. If the prescribed sequence was not adhered to, a safety circuit would trip, releasing the control rods, shutting down the reactor. The design of the control rod system was intended to shut down the reactor within seconds. However, to achieve this, time expectation, the rods were attached to a pneumatic system. The air pressure could be used to slowly raise the control rods from the reactor as well. Seven of the 12 rods 
would absorb enough neutrons to shut down the reactor completely. However, four were used as a safety bank for any planned shutdowns. The remaining eight rods went up and down using the preset sequence. The two banks of rods were activated by push buttons on the main panel in the control room. Another push button to seal the rods to the pneumatic system was located on the same panel. However, a few paces away on a separate control panel contained a button to blow down the rods into the reactor in the event of an emergency. Red lights in the control room were used to indicate to the operators whether the control rods were inside the reactor or not. However, this system would prove to have a potentially deadly fault, but we'll come back to this in a bit. On the 12th of December 1952, one of the world's first nuclear incidents would begin to unfold. The NRX was operating at low power, whilst the Calandria tubes were being investigated for a cooling issue. For the test, some of the tubes were disconnected from the original water cooling system, and instead were connected to a temporary arrangement with hoses. One of the tubes, however, were only being cooled by air. During tests, a supervisor noticed something very worrying happening to the reactor's control rods. You see, below the calandria were several valves in charge of controlling the rod's pneumatic system. By accident, an operator in the basement turned four valves, causing the air pressure from above holding the rods inside the reactor to be released, and the air pressure from below caused four rods to rise out of the core. The unwanted movement set off red lights in the main control room. Alarmed by this indication, the reactor supervisor phoned down to the operator in the basement to immediately stop what he was doing. Once off the phone, the supervisor hurriedly made his way down to the basement and closed the valves himself. After checking the air pressure, the supervisor assumed the control rods had made their way back into the core. Rightly so, as the red lights in the control room had now been extinguished. However, for an unknown reason, this indication was not correct. The supervisor from the basement called his assistant in the control room to request him to operate the push buttons to seal the withdrawn rods to pneumatic system. During the phone call, a miscommunication led the assistant to push the draw safety bank button. In so doing so, he placed the phone on the desk. Immediately realizing the mistake instruction, the supervisor shouted down the phone to the assistant to stop what he was doing. However, due to the phone being on the desk, no such instruction was heard. At 15.07, the reactor started to double in power every two seconds, originally starting at 0.1 megawatts. An operator noticing the rate of power increase tripped the reactor after 20 seconds, which should have forced the safety bank of rods into the core. However, this didn't happen and 90 seconds had passed, three rods had not moved and the fourth had moved slowly into position. At this time, the reactor passed 17 megawatt. The water in the tubes attached to the temporary cooling system began to boil, eventually causing some of them to rupture, setting off power even higher. Around 14 seconds later, the valves of the Calandra's heavy water were set off, dumping the heavy water onto the reactor building floor. The peak power reached an astonishing 80 megawatts before all the water moderator left the Calandra. Without the heavy water, no more reactions could take place, and the power output fell to zero after 25 seconds. In all, the reactor had been above one megawatt for just over one minute. Disaster averted? Actually, no, as a few of the fuel elements had melted, creating holes in the calandra, causing helium gas to escape. The melting fuel also released hydrogen and other gases as it reacted with the coolant water. Minutes later, at 15.11, the highly dangerous cocktail exploded. During the event, Fission products in gas form were vented to atmosphere and many litres of heavy water and contaminated coolant had leaked onto the reactor building floor. The incident was finally over. For several days after, the cooling system was kept running to remove any heat left over. However, this caused over 4,000 metres cubed of contaminated water to be dumped into the building's basement, reaching a depth of one metre. Needless to say, this would be a clean-up nightmare. During the clean-up efforts, the reactor core and calandra were removed and buried due to being damaged beyond repair. However, around 150 tubes had remained stable during the partial meltdown, showing that the design had proved to be fairly stable. The work inside the NRX reactor building took months to be fully decontaminated. The efforts drafted in 150 US Navy personnel, one of whom you might know as he was called Jimmy Carter the future 39th president of the USA. A further 170 military Canadian personnel and 20 civilian personnel were used to clean up the site, in addition to the 867 strong staff already working at Chalk River. Amazingly, the NRX would see many more years of use 
albeit with a new core in Calandria, finally being shut down on the 30th of March 1993 after 45 years of use. The legacy of the incident would be twofold, one good, one not so good. Let's start with the bad. With so much contaminated water created by the partial meltdown, a pipe was run to a sandy area some distance from the site complex. Around 10,000 curies of material was pumped into this area to seep away. This decision meant that the Ottawa River was saved from any major contamination. Water was monitored down river for any sign of radioactive contamination, but luckily nothing above natural levels were found. Staff involved in the accident cleanup were monitored for any health conditions and again thankfully nothing was reported above natural expected levels. So compared to some other incidents I've covered, the NRX is mild in terms of human and environmental casualties. Even though the legacy was not very bloody, the NRX partial meltdown is important for atomic history as many lessons would be learnt from the event. Even though the root cause for the events on the 12th of December 1952 was operator error, ultimately the human machine interface was the aggravating factor for the accident. As in a report by W.B. Lewis, who suggested a revised operational procedure should be adapted to take into account operator error. Future reactors will be designed with assurances for complete reactor shutdown via independence and variation of safety systems. So I suppose you could say that would be one of the good legacies of the incident. As we already know, the NRX continued to operate after substantial repairs, and its successor known as the NRU would carry on the evolution of reactor design and practices after its operational date of the 3rd of November 1957. However, it too would suffer an incident in 1958. Well, I suppose mistakes are made on the way to perfection. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave me a like. And if you'd like to, you can always subscribe. If you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comments below. And I have a Patreon if you fancy supporting me financially. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching.